In 2002, Ubisoft Montreal released Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Stealth Action Redefined to critical and commercial success, birthing one of the defining franchises of the stealth action genre. Shortly after, Ubisoft Shanghai took the reins with its sequel, Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow, further refining the gameplay of the first. Splinter Cell fans were happy with the follow-up, but little did they know that Sam Fisher's next mission was well underway, in development by the Montreal team since wrapping the original. And let's just say it was quite the update. What's up everybody, I'm Kirk, and man am I excited for this one. Like my previous Splinter Cell videos, this will be an epic deep dive into this landmark stealth title. We'll examine each of Chaos Theory's missions, all the mechanics that make it tick, as well as the new features and new creatives that help define it. This is a long one, and I hope you're ready for it. And if you're new here, and you find yourself digging what you're seeing, please consider liking and subscribing to help support this channel. Alrighty, slip on your goggles, maybe pack a towel, and keep an ear out for Kalashnikovs. It's time to get sneaky. Before the fun starts, let's cover a few basics. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Chaos Theory was released on March 21st, 2005. It was published by Ubisoft and developed by the original game's developer, Ubisoft Montreal, with Ubisoft Milan serving as a support studio, the culmination of a three-year development effort. It's the third game in the franchise and featured the return of the Spies vs. Mercs competitive multiplayer mode. It debuted a new cooperative multiplayer mode and, of course, featured a single-player campaign, once again starring the gruff, green green-eyed Sam Fisher. As was, and is, typical of Ubisoft releases, the game was put out for every system imaginable at the time. Sixth generation consoles, the PC, and even handheld systems like the Nintendo DS and N-Gage. Oh geez, who remembers the N-Gage? The PC and Xbox versions though were the top dogs, in terms of graphical fidelity and content, as the PS2 and GameCube versions, while decent, were simplified to accommodate for their system's weaker hardware. For this video, I stuck with the PC version, as it is my preference, but I did play a good chunk of the Xbox version through Series X Back Compat, and I gotta say, that's a quality way to experience this game. Back Compat adds enhancements like upscaled resolution, an HDR effect, and gives it a performance boost. Not quite 60 frames per second, but definitely above 30. Frankly, it's a better remaster than the official one put out on the PS3 back in 2011. Chaos Theory was released to much critical and fan acclaim, and to this day, after six mainline Splinter Cell games have hit the market, many fans still swear by it being the best of the series. Why, you might ask? Well, let's find out. Fisher, an American engineer named Bruce Morgan Holt has been kidnapped by a Peruvian separatist group called the People's Voice. We need you to get in there and recover or destroy any information Morgan Holt may have been forced to divulge, and if possible, rescue him. <laughs> Chaos Theory's slippery debut mission brings Sam to the coast of Peru, infiltrating an old lighthouse occupied by gorillas. Where past games put you through a blatant tutorial with information boxes and lots of radio chatter, the lighthouse does away with all of it. Instead, the game features training videos for every mechanic found in the main menu. That being said, the lighthouse still serves as a silent tutorial, a refresher for veterans and a workout for newbies. The early areas allow you to use your basic movement and combat functions, and there are spots for testing out your core gadgets, along with opportunities to use the newer features. It all flows together organically, and does make for a damn good Splinter Cell level. There's some decently tricky stealth puzzles to be had here, assuming the player is choosing to play it stealthily, and there's even a handful of alternate routes that can be discovered. It's a fantastic opening level, easily one of my favorites of the whole series. You will get no information from me. Really? Hmm, it looks like you forgot to shave this morning. Let me help you out a bit. Huh? You can't! Hey, what are you doing? 
Chaos Theory's basic gameplay is broadly unchanged from the previous entries. At its core, it's the same formula. Sneak your way through levels and complete your objectives. Stick to the shadows so you are not seen, and move slowly so you are not heard. And if you have to, use lethal and non-lethal means to deal with enemies. <laughs> For Chaos Theory, though, Montreal reapproached their initial formula, found areas to improve and expand upon, and then totally rebuilt their gameplay systems. It was a deep iteration that retained all the things that made Splinter Cell great, but also lent it a deeper, more realistic stealth system and totally revised game feel. That last part is particularly important, the game feel the closer-than-ever system. Which we're gonna take some time to talk about, because it is the foundation of what makes this sequel so damn good. Let's take a second and look at gameplay from the first two games specifically when you approach guards. Approaching guards, while you know, fun, admittedly had some clumsy aspects to it. If approaching a guard from behind, it was usually smooth sailing, but going at a guard from his sides or in front of them was always a little dicey, as it was a little hard to tell how close you could get to them without alerting them. Who is that? Show yourself. It was an aspect that felt imprecise, a bit loose, and for Chaos Theory, Montreal wanted to tighten it right up. Thus, in Chaos Theory, they introduced Closer Than Ever. What is Closer Than Ever? Well, it boils down to this. When Sam starts approaching an enemy, you'll notice his body language start to change. He lowers his stance, spreads out his arms, and stretches out his footsteps. Basically, he is getting more sneaky and tiptoey in relation to that enemy, which A, looks awesome and more realistic, but also B, signals to the player that they are in that guard's bubble and need to be careful. As they get closer, Sam will lean back and place a hand on his knife. This indicates that the player is in range to strike. Well, most of the time it does. Sometimes the hand goes on the knife prematurely, but 90% of the time, hand on knife means killing or head bopping is possible. But there's much more to it than just an animation tell. The controls for this are absolutely buttery smooth, and a big reason for that is how much more control the player has. In most video games, when you move a character forward, it initiates an animation cycle that plays out for however long you're doing the action. When the player stops, the animation cycle winds down to a resting position. The first two Splinter Cells work this way, but in Chaos, the player isn't initiating the animation cycle, but rather progressing that animation cycle frame by frame or roughly frame by frame. Here's what I mean. In the first Splinter Cell, if I tap the W key, or forward on the joystick, Sam will begin his animation cycle, but then quickly wind down to rest, looking like a janky little lurch. In Chaos Theory though, if I tap forward, Sam moves little by little. Like I said, roughly frame by frame. And if I tap backwards, that animation goes in reverse, frame by frame. What this means is that players have precise control over Sam's animations. Precise control over Sam. So if they're unsure how close they can be to a baddie, they can move up inch by inch. And Sam will hold his position to give the player a better sense of how they can move next. If the enemy does something unexpected, a player can course correct instantly. And if they suddenly lose their nerve, as long as they maintain their speed, they can immediately back up, like it never happened. It allows for a high level of precision and makes approaching guards not a guessing game, but a matter of certainty. Mmm, nah. When they say closer than ever, they mean closer than ever. With this high level of control and better sense of space, you can get extremely close to the guards, bending and weaving around their bodies, adjusting to their change in movement, and in general, sticking to them like you're their shadow. And oh yes, it absolutely leads to some heart-pounding close calls. Sometimes they can detect you, especially if Sam's silhouette is blocking a light source, or if you follow them a hair too long. But if you're in a pitch dark room with a lot of background noise, a guard pretty much has to be touching you to notice you. But it's still not the full picture of Closer Than Ever. The final element that makes it work is the camera. 
It may not be the flashiest improvement over the previous games, but I think the camera in Chaos Theory is one of its most impressive aspects. At first blush, the camera appears identical to the previous games. And sure, in broad strokes it is. But if you pay attention, you will notice the camera dynamically adjusting itself to better serve you. For example, if Sam is going down a narrow hallway and is favoring the right side, the camera will shift to the left, giving players a better view of what's ahead of them. And if players are trying to see around a corner, the camera will slightly move out to once again give them a better view. And of course, if Sam moves into a cramped space, the camera snaps right to his back. To be fair, the camera system in the first two games also behaved this way in small spaces, but otherwise the camera did not dynamically adjust, it just kept Sam in the center of the screen. Once you realize the camera is doing all of this, it's hard not to be amazed by it, particularly in how polished it is. It never gets stuck, never clips through anything except for Sam on the rarest of occasions, and I honestly marvel at watching him go from room to room corner to corner and watching the camera smoothly stick to him. And the cherry topper is that it always frames the action in cool cinematic ways. Okay, so how does this relate to Closer Than Ever? Well, whenever an enemy is on screen, you'll notice the camera shift its focus to them. And as the player moves closer and closer, this focus becomes stronger and stronger, almost as if the player is soft locked onto them. This helps players have a better feel for how they can move around them and strike. The camera is guiding you to them, but so subtly it's likely many players don't notice. So with the animations, the player's precise control over them, and the camera system helping to guide, these three aspects make up the Closer Than Ever system. And the result is that given enough time, players will gain a near instinctual sense of how close they can get to guards and how they can move around them. You will feel like a snake weaving through the grass, an absolute silent badass. What's great about it too is that because players have so much precision, they will be more daring, more likely to take chances and experiment. If it leads to failure, they likely won't blame the game, they'll blame themselves and try something else. But if they pull off some crazy stealth maneuver, the satisfaction is immense. Closer Than Ever is what made Chaos Theory. There's a lot of great things about this game as we're going to discuss, but this is what tied it all together. Like I said, it's the foundation. The precision of it was night and day compared to the original games, and it was night and day compared to a lot of other stealth games at the time. The next game in the series, Double Agent, would keep this system, and while Conviction dropped it in its major overhaul of the series mechanics, it did make a subtle return in Splinter Cell Blacklist. And you bet your ass I expect it to be in the upcoming remake of the first game. Going back to the old style would be an unwise backstab. Information you recovered in Peru makes it look like Hugo Lacerda was contracted by a third party to kidnap and interrogate Morganholt. Maria Narcissa is out to sea so there's no escape. Board her, find out who Lacerda's been dealing with, and then make sure he doesn't have an opportunity to spread what he knows. Fifth Freedom. I wouldn't say the cargo ship is a standout mission, but it is a solid one. Sam must make his way through the cramped, restrictive bowels of the ship, having to deal with flooded compartments and a gas leak, preventing him from using his weapons. I'm the fire inspector, and I'm worried that you or one of your stupid friends might try and squeeze a shot off in here. Why? There's more limitations on the player in this one, but it also allows them to explore other options that might not have been present in the Lighthouse mission. It's a maze-like level that can be a bit of a head-scratcher to navigate for first-time players, but there is a great sense of accomplishment for getting through it as an absolute ghost. I won't fire my weapon! I promise! 
While Chaos Theory served as a makeover for the series-based stealth mechanics, many of the previous systems and gadgets remain pretty much the same, but do feature some improvements, modifications, consolidations, and reintroductions. Sam's signature Van Dam split jump has returned after being modified to a half-split jump in Pandora Tomorrow, which was fine but not nearly as badass, and they made it a lot easier to do. Now, instead of timing some awkward wall jumps, if Sam is in a hallway where he can do it, indicated by him looking side to side, a few taps of the jump key and he'll automatically get himself up there ready to strike. Well, hello there. What you doing? I don't know what you're up to, but you better come out of there. Stealth open for doors, basically cracking them open slowly, makes a return from the first game. Oh yes, you heard that right, returned. Stealth opening was in the first game, but doing it was weirdly hidden in the menu. Now it's a clear option, and the player has control over how much they open it. You can bash the doors open now too, in case an enemy needs to be saved from consciousness. The flashiest new move is pulling guards over railings while hanging on them, which never gets old. <laughs> Whistling returns from Pandora Tomorrow and is still a handy tool for distraction. Is someone moving around out there? Who? I don't know who, that's why I'm worried. Although why anybody would investigate whistling coming from pure darkness is beyond me. I mean, what'd you think was gonna happen, dude? And as you can see, you can now melee attack while hanging on a pipe, with the choice of non-lethal or death crack. Keep the word choice on your mind, we're gonna be talking about it soon. The heads up display has been refreshed, but is very much the same vibe as the first two games, featuring the all important light meter, which tells you how visible you are. The new and very, very welcome addition is the sound meter, which tells you how loud you're being. The white square on it represents the environmental sound. If your noise goes above it, you will be heard. If you stay below it, you won't be heard. Simple as that. It's an incredibly helpful tool and a great way for players to gauge how fast they can move in an environment. Noisy down here. Oh, my! Makes it easy to sneak up on people. Most of Sam's classic gadgets make a return, with a few being dropped, like the disposable pick and camera jammer. And some have been combined, like the sticky camera and diversion camera. Now, sticky cameras can spy, distract, and gas, all in one handy device. And the laser mic has now been rolled into the scope in Sam's goggles, which also have the ability to remote hack. A big time saver. Speaking of the goggles, Sam can still utilize both night vision and thermal, and there's now some lens distortion, which is a nice graphical touch. Joining the vision modes is EMF, which highlights electromagnetic fields in the environment, or anything using electricity, a great way to spot security cameras. Ah, speaking of the cameras, all cameras in Chaos Theory are bulletproof. No shooting them out this time around, but don't worry, you're not up Shit's Creek without an Emmy. A new function of the pistol is the OCP, which shoots out a little EMP charge which can disable any piece of electrical equipment for a short amount of time. Like lights, and you guessed it, cameras. Why would the Americans do that? Of course, Sam's big new marketable tool is his knife. A multi-tool, really. Useful for rewiring and intimidation. How about I cut your ear off, see how tough you are then? Go ahead. I have two. But in terms of immediate gameplay function, the knife can cut through materials like plastic, which can reveal shortcuts, and of course, poking enemies until dead. Ah! Oh man, that throat slash is still so brutal. Melee attacks were thankfully revamped. Before, melee was a little bit of a headache. If Sam struck an enemy square in the back, he'd knock them out cold. But striking from the front, or sometimes the sides, caused an enemy to waffle around, dazed and confused, requiring a second hit to put him down. It was awkward and clumsy. Now, no matter which angle you approach them, enemies go down in one hit. All the player has to worry about is getting to them and choosing non-lethal or lethal. <laughs> This choice also extends to grabbing enemies, where Sam can choke them out unconscious or kill them by doing whatever that is. I've never understood this move. Is he breaking their spine? Choice is a major aspect of chaos theory, and I'm not talking about black and white good and evil choices that slightly affect the ending or something. No, no, no. I'm talking about choices in moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that actually have consequences. 
You, of course, have to deal with the classic stealth game dilemma of to kill or not to kill. Killing a guard will make things easier, but will risk more attention and danger. Knocking them out is safer, but they can still be revived and put the other guards on guard. Eh, yeah, perhaps it's just better to leave the guards alone, but of course, that can pose a tricky stealth puzzle. It's a choice that can make the game easier on you or harder on you. A trade-off. But what's fun about Chaos Theory is that Montreal was able to apply that sort of trade-off to more aspects of the game. For instance, when you find a locked door, you still have the option to lockpick it, with the same minigame as before. Yeah, this definitely hasn't gotten old after three games. But if you don't have the patience for it, you can also break the lock with your knife and be on your merry way. Way faster and easier, but breaking locks is loud and can be heard by guards. And even if they don't hear it, they can still find the broken lock later and be tipped off to your presence. Keypads and retinal scanners are returning obstacles. However, instead of tracking down a code or politely asking for cooperation, the player can now hack these devices with a brand new, somewhat tiresome minigame of selecting lit up numbers. Problem is, if the player screws up, they can set off an alarm. Fisher, watch the alarms. This is a bank robbery after all. Generators are a new mechanic, where flipping them off shuts off the lights in an area, but a patrolling guard will investigate and eventually turn it back on. A player can opt to pierce the generator's gas tank instead, which shuts the lights off permanently, but guards will know an intruder is nearby and go on the alert. Options. The player has them, and while some might make things convenient in the short term, they hold the possibility of long-term consequences. And these guards are not dumb, and will search you out if you give them enough reasons to. A broken lock will make them suspicious, which will lead them to the door you left open, and then the light you shot out, and eventually the guard you killed, which triggers the alarm. There's actually a training video that shows this chain reaction titled, What Not To Do. Who broke that lock? But having these options and weighing the pros and cons in the heat of the moment is what makes Chaos Theory so much fun. Chaos Theory is a puzzle with many solutions. A mistake in past games would likely lead to a game over. Now, mistakes can be recovered if the player is quick on their feet and uses the tools around them. They'll feel more enabled in this game, not restricted. Part of that is because Chaos Theory doesn't punish mistakes as harshly as its predecessors. There's still an alarm system in this game, but raising too many alarms no longer leads to a game over. Don't tell me. Three alarms and the mission is over? Of course not. This is no video game, Fisher. Oh, well, look at us getting all meta. There are no game overs, but the alarms will make the mission harder. Enemies will be on the offensive, and there will be more security measures. But it sure as hell beats a sudden game over. Even killing off-limit targets, like civilians or allies, won't lead to an automatic game over like in past games. Sweet Jesus, Fisher. What did you do? It was an accident but it will demolish your final score. That's the real punishment for mistakes in this game. It won't make you reload a save or repeat progress, it'll just give you a bad grade. I actually have some issues with this game's scoring system, but I'm gonna talk about it a little later in the video. All of this stems from a core goal Ubisoft Montreal had for this game, to give players the freedom to improvise, encourage them and enable them to experiment and come up with their own solutions, and be motivated to retry each mission in different playstyles, whether they be violent or non-violent, quiet or loud. Sure, there are best practices and best paths for achieving the absolute best score on each mission, but personally, I still enjoy trying stuff out in this game, and to this day, I'm still surprised at just how deep and reactive this stealth system is. Chaos Theory, in a lot of ways, is not so much a stealth action game, but rather a stealth sandbox. So now, if players truly have no interest in taking the path of pure stealth and would rather blaze a trail of carnage, they'll find they have the firepower to do so. Shooting still takes place from over the shoulder, but a nice tweak is being able to switch from shoulder to shoulder. And whoever on the Montreal team suggested that first gets high fives for life. Firing weapons does feel better over the previous games, a little more punchy, and guards aren't as spongy as they were in the last games, although headshots are still the way to go. Oh yeah, bullet to the head, all bones turn to rubber. Nothing like mid-2000s ragdolls. 
In terms of arsenal, we have the return of the pistol and the staple SC-20K, which comes with its launchable non-lethal toys. But now the SC-20K comes with new attachments to beef up its firepower. The sniper attachment was actually in the last two games, but here it's beefy and loud. Honestly, there's only a handful of spots in the game where this is actually handy. The foregrip might as well be called the headshot tool. It slows down Sam's aim and makes it a little less wiggly, making it easier to pull off shots to the dome. But the shotgun attachment... Back up! Oh mama. This thing is a powerhouse that can launch enemies in just a few shots. Trade-offs being it's loud as hell and has to be reloaded one round at a time. But man oh man is it fun to use. Seriously, if staying stealthy in this game is causing some frustration, take a second and go back to an older level and go through it shotgunning guys. It's a good and admittedly psychotic way to blow off steam. In fact, while you're at it, make sure you go ham with all the weapons at least once, especially the knife, and really experience Sam Fisher when he's feeling wrathful. that Lacerda had were purchased by someone using a Panamanian offshore bank as proxy. I want to take a peek inside their records. This op can't look like a U.S. intelligence gig, so to cover it up, you'll need to crack the bank's vault and lift some bearer bonds, property of the French government. Ah, the Panamanian bank. This is a mission that always warmly pops into my mind whenever I think of chaos theory, as it's my favorite of the whole game. I get a kick out of watching Sam play pretend burglar, wearing a black ski cap and face paint, and dealing with heist tropes like infiltrating by a rope through the skylight and lasers. You even have a professional bank robber serving time who helps you over radio, and sounds like he was ripped straight out of a Guy Ritchie film. This is the Mason Wells 88. Each one is unique. You want to get a butcher's up this girl's skirt. First thing you need to do is authorize an opening. Speaking of lasers, one great obstacle in this mission is a floor covered by a laser grid, which has quite the solution to overcome. There's a guard who seems to be walking around here, no problem. Maybe he has some kind of beacon. Get close and you can stay in his electronic shadow. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Or you can knock the guard out and carry his body through. Real clever. <laughs> Chaos Theory features a techno-thriller narrative very much in line with the previous games and other Tom Clancy properties around this time. Tom Clancy's stories are essentially what-if tales. They draw upon the real-life politics, culture, and military technology of the time to present a conflict that is meant to seem feasible in the real world. But they also feature enough character drama and unrealistic action movie moments to remind you that it is indeed a work of fiction. Events in the Yellow Sea took a turn for the worse today when North Korean and Chinese forces... Chaos Theory takes place in 2007, and tensions are high between China, North Korea, South Korea, and Japan. Japan has recently established the Information Self-Defense Force, a move that has outright pissed off its neighbors, who claim that it is in violation of the post-World War II Constitution, which prevents Japan from having a military force that can strike outside its country. Meanwhile, after doing some digging of their own, the third echelon team start to suspect that the situation at hand might be a part of a larger conspiracy, which plans to utilize the mass kernels, weaponized algorithms that were at the heart of the Georgian information crisis from the original game. And so, once again, third echelon must take it upon themselves to expose this larger conspiracy and prevent the breakout of World War III. Wouldn't miss it for the world. 
Of the three original Splinter Cell games, I've always felt Chaos Theory had the stronger narrative. Now, when I say stronger, I mean stronger by a hair or two. Like the last games, the basic plot does hold my interest, but the actual storytelling hardly blows my hair back, and there are definitely some elements of this plot that feel underbaked, which I'll touch on throughout the video. But I think what helps this one stand out for me is the writing of the characters. Sam especially. In Pandora, I always felt he came off too grumpy and cynical. The world is small, nasty, and complicated, and everybody dies alone. In Chaos, he's still a cynical bastard and clearly gets a lot of joy out of making enemy combatants wet their pants. I'm allergic to flowers. Maybe you should talk before I sneeze and accidentally cut your throat. Oh god! <laughs> But he feels more like he did in the first game. A man who believes in what he's doing, is confident in his abilities, but is critical of the politics and minutia of the organization he works for. Which usually gets him saying all sorts of sassy stuff. You can make a lot of people's jobs a whole lot safer. How come no one ever does things to make my job safer? If you want me to hire some more analysts to interpret information for you, I can do that. Well, now... Second thought. The danger's not so bad a gruff and brutal anti-hero who does have a heart of gold. You keep doing what you're doing, you'll just end up another unknown soldier. I'm not in it for the fame. The great Michael Ironside once again reprises his role as the seasoned Splinter Cell, and unsurprisingly, murders it. Every time I hear his performance, I just can't help but sense the veteran actor having an absolute blast, and you can feel a lot of energy coming from his performance in this one. Oh no, you are going to kill me, right? Only if you say the word monkey. Actually, the voice acting across the board in Chaos Theory is rather strong. One huge improvement over Pandora Tomorrow is the chatter for guards. She called me. We're gonna go have dinner. I'm gonna take her to Rick's. Rick's? That place is expensive. Yeah, I know their conversations aren't exactly stimulating, but A, they actually sound like they were voiced by actual voice actors and not the dev team, and B, they actually sound like their country of origin. How many men aboard? Total, there is 36 of us, I think. Might I remind everyone of interrogating Pandora's Indonesian gorillas? My men planted the mines on our way out. We had to escort to defend the village. There's even an option in the menu to have guards speak their native language. Será suficiente cuando deje de hablar. Santo cielo, pero si hace más de una hora que no puede hablar. Pandora Tomorrow was outright embarrassing in this aspect, so it's good to see some improvement here. Fisher, remember, I need you to bring in Zerkezi alive. What about Nedich? Nedich is another story. Don Jordan reprises his role as Irving Lambert, after Dennis Haysbert, the Allstate guy, took it over in Pandora Tomorrow, and it's great to have him back. Haysbert was fine in the role, but to me, Don Jordan will always be the definitive Lambert. There's more warmth and personality in his performance, and it's great to hear his voice coming through the radio again. Now that I'm holding 50 million bucks, I think we need to talk about that raise again. Mm. 25 cents an hour and not a penny more. Deal. Oh yeah, the voice chatter. What really puts the bow on my enjoyment of this game's story is the radio chatter between Sam and his team. You can tell these people are a lot more comfortable working with each other, often tossing out jokes and making fun of each other. Maria Narcissa. You're not trying to set me up on another blind date, I hope. The Maria Narcissa is a boat. So was the last girl you set me up with. Fisher. Sorry. My favorite lines are between Sam and Anna Grimm's daughter, a character who has been in the franchise since the beginning, but comes more into her own in the third outing. A running joke throughout the game is how Anna starts to make Sam feel his years. I spent most of the rest of that year sleeping in a ditch on the road between Baghdad and Kuwait. Oh well, if it's any consolation, I had a bad year that year too. What? You weren't working for the government during the Gulf War? No, I was in 10th grade. Oh, right. Yuck. It's this kind of stuff that makes these people feel human. Lasers. Lasers are so... 90s? I was gonna say 70s. Can you please stop making me feel old? Got bad news for you, Sam. You are old. Also, as a longtime fan of this series, it's always a little trippy hearing Sam and Anna have these sort of conversations, since the relationship, let's just say, goes through some changes in the later games. <laughs> It's been 
been 24 hours since the blackout, and no one has a clue when it might end. We've got sporadic reports of unrest all over Manhattan. Word coming down from above is that the National Guard will be deployed within the hour. The Big Apple's grid is down, and Sam is in the thick of it, trying to track down the mysterious figure known as Dvorak. Manhattan is tricky. This is the first mission that puts a strict no-killing parameter on you. Those boys aren't expecting to see you, and they'll attack on sight. Do not, I repeat, do not kill any of them. The initial section is a good workout of stealth reflexes, as you try to get by the good guardsmen in cramped quarters. One goofily cringe thing that has kept this mission memorable for me is that it features one of the most blatant examples of product placement I've ever seen in a game. The giant lit up axe sign that the player directly interacts with. Yeah, nobody has power in New York City, but thank god the axe sign is still on. Hey kids, do you smell like shit or need a makeshift flamethrower? Then look no further. Besides this sign, Chaos Theory isn't horrible about its product placement, at least not as horrible as other games around this time, but it's there, right in your face as intended. It's pretty funny a bank is all about having screensavers for AMD's latest processor. And wow, who would have thunk Nokia would be a sponsor of the Japanese Defense Ministry? And of course, Ubisoft had to throw a plug in there too. He's got the new Prince of Persia. Yeah, I heard it's awesome. Gonna be game of the year, man. Well, I don't know about Game of the Year, but it was an improvement. Unless they're talking about Warrior Within, which in that case, heh, <laughs> no. Anyways, eventually you come to a fancy penthouse, powered up by its own electrical grid. Inconvenient is how I would describe this portion. There's a ton of cameras, all in inconvenient spots, and there's not a lot of shadow cover, on top of having to operate on loud gravelly surfaces and deal with remote mines. This thing's a mess! You have to get a little more inventive in this mission if you want to get through it unseen. It's all worth it though, because this mission leads to one of the more bizarre moments in all of Splinter Cell, meeting Dvorak, who happens to be a giant supercomputer, and its caretaker, who sounds like the Crypt Keeper. Dvorak encodes its own logical structure within its own executable cycle, and Right. Derives Grim, did you get that? My god, it's an infinite state machine. Yeah, I looked up what that is, by the way, and, uh, yeah, let's just say I wasn't smart enough to understand it. But as far as I could tell, this old bucket of bolts is quite extraordinary, and the key to our number one sneaky guy saving the day. Lambert, something weird is happening. I'll say. In terms of visuals, Chaos Theory was a significant leap over the first two games, where Pandora Tomorrow largely modified existing assets from the first game. For Chaos Theory, Montreal rebuilt everything from scratch. Like its predecessors, the game still used Unreal Engine 2. However, Montreal threw in a host of shiny new graphical features that were cutting edge for the time. Normal mapping and specular highlights paint each environment, adding a lot of texture and detail, and players might observe refraction in the water and glass surfaces, as well as heat distortion in hot and humid areas. But easily the biggest graphical flex of Chaos Theory is how it renders wetness. Mm, yes wetness. Using specular highlights, Montreal managed to create the illusion of wet surfaces. And the effect, while maybe a little strong by today's standards, still looks believably moist. Not a lot of games had effects like these back in 05, which is why it blew my mind when I first played Chaos Theory. And even today, it still looks pretty convincing. I think that confirms it, Fisher. Yeah, seems like Lacerda's is long gone. Enemies sport more detail, smoother animations, and more animations expressing their body language, like how they tense up when spooked. They also have a wider range of facial animations with believable expressions, or rather more believable expressions of fear. Not to mention Sam himself. Along with his own array of facial animations, Sam's various sneaking suits sport a lot more detail, and if you look closely, you can see the stubble bumps on the side of his shaved head. And this wetness effect is most impressive on him. When out in the rain, his suit will get wet and shiny, and when he goes back indoors, it slowly dries. Some of it hasn't aged gracefully, for sure. A few of these models and animations look to be the stuff of nightmares. Oh jeez, what is wrong with your mouth? Also, if you look a little too closely at Sam, you might spot some confusing anatomy. 
Like, is there an extra bicep or shoulder in here? Doesn't that look a little weird to you? Shadows are another sore spot. Splinter Cell was famous for how realistically it depicted light and shadow, and Chaos Theory continues that on. But for me, on the PC version, it was a little rough. I started with all settings maxed, with the high-end Shader 3.0 option switched on, which included soft shadows. Soft shadows are inconsistent. Sometimes they look fine, other times they look horrible. Turning this off or to Shader 1.1 presents the normal shadows, which are about on par with the Xbox version. I think these look a lot better, but they can still look pretty low res from time to time. And that's with shadow resolution turned up to high. How the shadows behave, I still think is impressive but how they look, eh, they've seen better days. Also, the game has an HDR setting, or rather something that mimics HDR, making the light sources look softer but richer. Not that far off from a bloom effect. I don't mind it, but there are a few spots where it's totally broken, like this lobby in the final mission, where lights coming through these windows are totally blown out. Turn HDR off and it looks as it should. But hey, it is a 17-year-old game. I'm old. And call me nostalgic, but I still think it looks great. It's just so striking to look at. There's almost a painted feel to some of the textures, and the way lights break up the pitch black darkness creates such a suspenseful atmosphere. It's one of those games I always enjoy looking at, despite showing its age. Fisher, we need to find out if Displacers or KZ are working together. But until we know, you want me to keep it quiet. Don't kill anyone or I'll abort the mission. Well, I guess it's not a Splinter Cell game unless you're sneaking through at least one office building. Displace is one of the better missions in the game, but for some reason I always forget about it. Probably because it's so damn bland looking. I mean, plain blue walls isn't gonna win against rain-slicked Peruvian coasts and urban war zones. But this is a great level to stealth through. The challenge is balanced and really pushes the player to think about what they're doing. And it has a pretty heart-pounding moment where you almost get caught hacking the server and have to scurry out by rope. I see it. Power's coming back on. I see it, Grim. You got company. You might want to... I see it. But what's cool about Displace is that it's a great example of one of the best aspects of Splinter Cell's level design. Branching paths. This whole video I've been harping on about choice, and that choice absolutely extends to how the player can approach each mission. Alternate paths were featured in previous games, but not quite to the degree of chaos theory. I don't know if I'd go as far as to call this game non-linear, but there's always some type of fork in the road or out of the way path the player can utilize, which may mean the difference between trial and error frustration and smooth sailing. There's plenty of examples for this, but the most extravagant comes in the Soul mission late in the game. Sam has to get inside a vault to recover some data. Outside the building holding it, he can go right up the ladder, into a vent, and right down into the vault. However, soon after, the doors are blown open by soldiers, which the player can deal with or not deal with. Ah, but if they go through the door on the left, they come to what looks like a dead end of third degree burns. But if they hop up on the pipe on the ceiling, they can bypass it, just in time to watch the two soldiers blow open the vault, after which you can follow them in and deal with them how you please. In this place, the branching paths are numerous and immediate. In the beginning, you have to catch up to a stuffy executive carrying a briefcase that has to be remote hacked. The player can follow him directly, waiting for the moment he puts that case down to scan it. Huh. Or they can choose to jump over this railing to the floor below, which will bring them to the first of that mission's secondary objectives. More on those in a bit. After that, they'll be looped right to the businessman and have another opportunity to hack. Oh ho, but there's more. After that, there are two doors on both sides of this guard post that lead to research and development. To the left is a longer path through that building's gym, which is generally safer. The right path is faster, but players will have to get past a laser grid with a guard, which can present some complications. Regardless of what the player does, the next destination is the server room. To get there, they can go through the turret testing course that will bring them to this vent shaft that leads to the server. Or, if they look carefully, they'll find another vent entrance hidden in a keypad locked room. The whole level feels like several figure eights connected to each other, a bunch of loops all along the critical path, but constructed in a way that's not immediately obvious to the player. 
What's great about this is pretty simple. For starters, it makes the map feel more realistic and rewards players for exploring. And frankly, who doesn't love uncovering an alternate solution to a stealth problem? For me, it's a similar feeling to finding a hidden room in Zelda, but it really can offer different experiences for many of the levels. It's replayability, simple and elegant. Hey, who are you? Pretend I'm Harry Tuttle. Uh, oh? I'm an ill-tempered and heavily armed heating engineer who's asking questions about your ventilation system. Oh wow, Sam's a Gilliam fan. One new feature in Chaos Theory that serves as a catalyst for replaying these levels are the optional secondary objectives. What these really entail is quote unquote collecting. Collecting being scanning, hacking, or rewiring a certain amount of something. In the Lighthouse mission, it's weapon crates that have to be scanned. That's four of the five crates, Sam. In the bank, it's planting emails to make it look like an inside job. And in Displace, it's hacking servers for Grimm's daughter. Good work, Sam. Upload that program to the last server and you'll make me the happiest girl in the world. If I had to be harsh, the secondary objectives are pretty much filler. They're not really the most thrilling things to do in the world. You're basically walking to something and hitting the action button. But what's good about them is that they further push the player to fully explore the levels, which in turn leads them to discovering the branching paths. Don't be shocked if you miss a few of these the first time around. That's the idea, to make you go back and find them. Plus, completing them is required to achieve a 100% mission rating. Ah yes, the scoring system. Let's go ahead and talk about that. Each mission in Chaos Theory grades your performance out of 100, with points deducted for whatever the game deems an infraction. To achieve it means completing all possible objectives and getting through the mission with no trace of you being there. Makes sense, right? But hold on, Kirk. Didn't you say you were critical of this system a while back? Why, yes I did, astute viewer. Here's why. Remember earlier when I talked about how great it was this game gave players so many options to complete levels and gave them room to experiment, making Chaos Theory a fun stealth sandbox? Well, the scoring system kind of undermines this. As I said, the trick is to get through each mission without a trace. That means setting off no alarms, having no bodies discovered, and as you might guess, killing no one. My issue is that for a game that provides so many options, provides so many tools, and allows for so much improvisation and player creativity with them, it feels a little weird that to achieve a perfect score means the level must be completed in one rigid way. And yeah, that bothers me. I mean, why include the powerful weapon attachments if the game will ultimately punish you for using them? How many players are just going to ignore something like the shotgun attachment because it's just going to detract from their score? And some of the scoring is a little silly to me. Once again, the goal is to leave no trace, but for some reason, knocking out guards does not detract from your score. <clears throat> oh yeah, you can knock out every guard in a mission, and as long as they're not found, you'll get 100%. I mean, think about this. Wouldn't knocking everyone out still leave a trace, tipping off that there was an intruder? Wouldn't the NSA still frown on that? The other thing too is that the scoring system means absolutely nothing beyond bragging rights. There's no achievement in getting 100% on each mission because achievements didn't exist when the game first came out, and there's no secret unlocks to enjoy. I mean, for Pete's sake, the game came with a teaser for a Splinter Cell movie that <laughs> never got made, but that would have been the perfect unlock for getting 100% on each mission. The score is the one aspect I'm the most critical of in this game. And hey, don't get me wrong, it's fun achieving 100% on these missions by being a pure ghost. But I just wish the scoring system also judged you based on other playstyles as well. To be fair, a later Splinter Cell title would solve this exact issue by introducing a scoring system that indeed judged players on a particular style, which worked pretty well. Now, does this scoring system ruin the game? Hardly. I just wish the devs put more thought into it. Fisher, if I can't throw the Joint Chiefs a bone, we'll be at war in the next 24. I need you to bring in Zerkesi for questioning. Mylon Nedich has moved him to Hokkaido for protection. In the Panama mission, Sam got to pretend to be a bank robber. In Hokkaido, slipping into an old Japanese estate by the cover of night, dressed head to toe in nothing but black, Fisher plays the role of ninja. Yeah, not really that much of a stretch for him. I'm the biggest coward you've ever met. That's quite a claim. I've already wet myself. Well, then you've made the top 10. The old estate you're breaking into has been renovated into a private retreat for the wealthy and powerful to relax, meditate, and get some spa time in. And every time I play this mission, I can't help but think, man, 
It would be nice to stay here. I mean, you get to enjoy the beautiful old Japanese architecture with a more modern wing to sleep in. You're right in the thick of nature and there's huge courtyards to stretch and think. Only downside is the narrow hallways that barely have any light, which would make a late night snack run a pain in the ass, but a dream to sneak through if you're trying to assassinate a high value target. Please, let me go. You're not leaving here alive, Nevich. But if you tell me what I want to know, I can make the end a little easier for you. This mission features a clever security system where the floors will make noise if you walk on them too fast. It kind of sounds like a high-pitched frog croak. Apparently, it was something designed to detect actual ninjas. Sounds like I'm walking on a family of parakeets. Nightingales. It's called a nightingale floor. Protection against ninjas. Yeah, all right, I guess it sounds like that. Cover is actually sparser than it appears, making things a little more restrictive, and can push players to take some risks. But that doesn't mean there aren't advantages. There's a few hefty branching paths to help you navigate, and let's just say the paper walls are not in the enemy's best interest. I mentioned earlier that the guards in this game are rather smart. Am I seeing things? Okay, they're not perfect. Ones and zeros can only get us so far, folks. I saw something there. In broad strokes, they aren't much different from the guards of the last games, but have more reactions to communicate their state of mind. And these goons are a reactive bunch. Put down the As I pointed out, signs of your presence, an open door, broken light, can get them suspicious and searching for you. And they don't give up easily. If you're sweating through these missions, it's a good sign you need to slow down and be more mindful about what you're doing. And these guys aren't fools in the heat of the moment. If they get spooked in the dark, they are not shy about whipping out a flashlight or flare to help them see, and calling out to a nearby friend to help them. Not to mention, if they're in combat, they will dive for cover and try to flank you. They can be a hair too touchy for sure. There were definitely some WTF moments where they got alerted by seemingly nothing. I suspect the AI always has some idea where the player is because at times the enemy can suddenly detect you and go full Rambo. But for the most part, they do behave logically, which means dealing with them is a matter of using common sense, which only helps the game feel more realistic. Cover! Less than 24 hours from open war on the Korean Peninsula, we've located the battery that launched the missile against the Walsh. If there is any credence to the North Korean claim that the launch was unintentional, we need to prove it. And fast. Battery is probably my least favorite mission of the game. Not for any specific reason, really. In fact, I'll tell you right now, I like all of Chaos Theory's missions. It's really just a taste thing. Battery is well-designed and fun to play through. It just isn't much of a standout for me compared to the other missions. It's pretty standard Splinter Cell here. Sneaking through an enemy base, disabling cameras, interrogating fools, and climbing on pipes. The highlight comes at the end when Sam has to stop a missile launch. It is heart pounding, making you run from one side of the map to the other to abort the missile in a limited amount of time. And depending on how you've been treating the guards up to this point, this can either be real easy or real nerve wrackingly tough. A good mission. Not on the top of my list, but not one I throw any shade towards. Hurry, the missile is closing on the USS Ronald Reagan at top speed. Uh, hold on. Did you just tell me I need to win one for the Gipper? Uh, dude, what does that even mean? Rain. Uh, never mind. You're right, Grim. I am old. One thing I've neglected to talk about so far, but that I've been trying to show off as much as possible with this edit, is the game's soundtrack. The music was composed by Amon Tobin, a Brazilian electronic artist known for his dark, surreal style that samples a wide array of recorded sounds. We also have to shout out Jesper Kidd, who composed the music for the cutscenes. Jesper Kidd, of course, is a prolific video game composer, whose work you might have heard in the Assassin's Creed and Hitman series, and he's responsible for the epic Freedom Fighters soundtrack. Hells yeah. 
a composer I hope to gush more about someday. But for this game, the spotlight really is on Tobin. I'll tell you all flat out, not only is Chaos Theory's soundtrack my favorite of the series, it's also one of my favorite gaming soundtracks of all time. Hearing the music for the first time, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was all over the place. If it's not a simple yet catchy beat accented by distortions and hit and run samples, it's a blast of boasting horns and strings and harsh pointed percussion. It can sound absolutely, well, chaotic, which is the point. What Tobin has done is compose the musical equivalent of chaos. Just when you think the music is taking a familiar form, it can suddenly veer into something totally different. It's unpredictable, a little bizarre, but never messy. There is always a structure for the listener to latch onto, and the music always succeeds in conveying emotion. If I had to describe it further, it's as if Tobin took every spy thriller soundtrack ever, pulled them apart, and then reconstructed them into a beat-heavy collage. Like the last games, the soundtrack is dynamic. There is a chiller default sneaking track for every level, which shifts into something more intense whenever an enemy is suspicious or alerted. In Chaos Theory though, these tracks seamlessly morph in and out of each other. The themes for suspicion or alert essentially build upon the bass chill track, adding more instrumentation, which can smoothly ramp back down to the chill track or spike into something really chaotic if the player engages in combat. This is not an unheard of technique. Plenty of games were doing exactly this around this time, but Tobin's work is one of the shining examples of how to do it right. Is that? I thought I saw something. Admittedly, it can make a strange atmosphere for the type of work Sam does, but it also does an incredible job engaging the player and getting them anxious and on the edge of their seats when things start to get wild. I'll leave you with one of the more energetic tracks from the game as we transition into the next section. Welcome to the Three Block War, Fisher. The main advance has bypassed your position. Whose side am I on here? Your own. You're not a legal combatant. Anyone who sees you will attack on sight, friend or foe. The city of Seoul is now a war zone. Smoke fills the air as soldiers trade shots in the rubble. Sam must make his way through this hell to prevent North Korean forces from getting their hands on critical data that would justify their occupation. And whether he remains a neutral combatant or helps tip the scales is up to the player. I knew I should have stayed in bed. Soul is one of the more memorable missions of the game. It's absolutely saturated with the ambiance of battle. Gunfire, distant explosions, buildings crumbling, people screaming. Sam spends most of the time traveling through bombed out buildings and rubble, with hints of the wartime atrocities taking place, like a teddy bear sitting next to a remote mine. Eh, that's just dark. It gives the level a moody yet unpredictable feel, and it's hard not to be on edge. The final touch is the enemy combatants fighting each other. It is a little suspenseful being the fly on the wall watching these soldiers fight. We've got incoming shots! As mentioned, the player can stay out of the fighting or get involved, and no matter what they decide, there's plenty of cover to fight from and plenty of paths to get yourself around the bloodshed. We have multiple reports of more active armor in your immediate AO. Great. I admit though, I have a bit of a love-hate thing with this mission. I love the concept and much of the design, but there are a few areas in this mission that have always driven me nuts. One section I always dread has you traversing through soldier-infested rooftops while trying to outrun a UAV, which is pure death on a propeller. If it spots you, it can somehow alert all enemies to your presence, regardless of if they can see you in the spotlight. Not like it matters though, because the UAV's Gatling gun will utterly squash you. It can't be destroyed, and its spotlight is super sporadic and hard to predict. Give me some support! However, I think part of me loathing this stems from my younger self having trouble with it back in the day. And after my recent playthroughs, I realized this section isn't nearly as bad as I remembered. The UAV has a set path that you can easily learn just by watching it. You can EMP it for a generous amount of time. And you know what? Stealthing through here with the pressure of the UAV was a solid challenge. I still dislike the things I dislike about 
about it, but I do have a lot more respect for this section. However, the APC at the end of this mission is the goddamn devil. You have to sneak past this thing, and the problem is that if its rotating gun detects you, you're basically done. You have to move when the gun is pointed away from you, which is easier said than done. It has to be heat seeking because no matter how hidden you are, that gun is able to detect you. It's a section that always requires a lot of trial and error for me and feels more janky than anything. Probably my least favorite part of the whole game. Lambert, I'm in position. Something interesting happens on this level. After Sam retrieves the data, he has to upload it to a passing fighter jet. Unfortunately, the jet gets shot down, and Sam has to track down the crash site and retrieve the data. Listen to what transpires. The plane is too badly damaged to recover the data. You'll need to fall back and designate the target for an airstrike. Use the structure down the street for your platform. Let me get the pilots to safety first. We don't have a lot of time, Sam. An NKA recovery team is en route. Are you ordering me to leave these guys here and call in an airstrike? I'm telling you what the objective is. Trusting you to complete it. You have your orders. The player has a choice here. They can defy Lambert's orders and carry the pilots to safety, or leave them to be killed in the explosion. It's interesting, a neat thing for Montreal to experiment with, but to be honest, I find this specific scenario to be... Kinda dumb. Okay, so for starters, the safe zone for the pilots is literally an alleyway around the corner, close to the down plane. It's debatable if these guys could survive a missile blast from here, or perhaps I'm just being too harsh on game logic. The other thing is that this choice has zero effect on the game, and zero effect on the story. Pandora Tomorrow had similar choice events, but those actually held consequences for your mission. Here, the only consequences are on the player's conscience, which is interesting, but kinda silly in the long run. But what irks me more about this part is how Lambert responds to it. If you choose to save the pilots, he's not very happy about it. Fisher, if you compromise this mission for those men... Save it, Irving. You gave me my orders already. But then he goes as far as to accuse Sam of doing it for the recognition. You don't even exist, Fisher. You can't get a medal for this. Medals don't help me sleep at night, Lambert. Look, I can understand Lambert being shitty and making a decision like this, but after working with Sam for years and years and supporting him as he saved the world and risked his life for millions, perhaps billions of people, does he really believe Sam is doing this just to get a big old shiny medal? Yeah, I don't find the writing in this portion to be particularly good. I don't buy that Lambert would act this way, and this scene doesn't really do anything for the game other than add some shock value. Sam! You need to designate the... No point in rescuing one and leaving the other. Fisher, critical update. I have other assets on the ground not far from your position. Another splinter cell? Splinter cells in training. One of the surprises and highlights of Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow was the introduction of the Spies vs. Mercenaries competitive multiplayer mode. Two spies go against two mercs, an intense, objective-based, asymmetrical multiplayer. The spies playing in third person, the mercs in first. The famous mode returned for Chaos Theory, and was more of a sprucing up than follow up, looking and playing largely the same as the initial version. But fans were hardly fussed, as they were able to enjoy new game modes, maps, gadgets, and other tweaks. But for Chaos Theory, Ubisoft decided to take things a step further, and introduced a new two player cooperative mode that could be played online or through split screen. <laughs> The co-op mode takes place across five missions, with a story that parallels and connects to the single-player campaign. Players have access to all of Splinter Cell's moves and gadgets, but now can pull off special cooperative maneuvers, done with a single contextual co-op button. Ready when you are. They can hurl each other over gaps, repel with one character holding and repositioning the rope, and along those lines they can also lower each other down, Mission Impossible style. And we can't forget the classic boost jump, where afterwards the booster can use the boostee as a ladder. Ready when you are. That's right. Climb up on daddy. 
and players have the wiggle room to experiment with these moves and complete objectives in alternate ways. The trainees also have their own version of the OCP. Where Sam shoots a timed charge, these two have to hold the charge, similar to the camera jammer from the first game, with one shorting out the light or camera while the other passes. Let us join Special Agent Bob and Secret Agent Steve, two of the finest official unofficial splinter cells. Funny thing, I had never gone through Chaos Theory co-op before the making of this video. In fact, I was only familiar with it because of the Bob and Steve shorts that used to play on Classic X-Play back in the day. Anybody still remember those? You're a wonderful dancer. I can, I can tell you enjoy this. The look on your face says it all. What are you doing? Nothing. So for this video, I opted to finally play through it, and I went with the Xbox version because, well, frankly, I'll take couch co-op over beers and bowls any day of the week. So what did I think of it? Huh, thought it was a blast. Pulling off co-op moves with a partner is intuitive and a lot of fun, but I also appreciated the freedom to split up and complete objectives on your own when able. The level design is tight and solid and often built as a looping path, so players don't have to deal with backtracking after completing objectives. Visually, the missions are a lot simpler compared to the single player campaign, which isn't shocking. Keeping good performance is always tricky in split-screen modes, so it makes sense that there were some graphical sacrifices. But this fish market might be one of the ugliest areas I've ever seen in a Splinter Cell. The Satis side dealings are a whole nother can of worms. I'll send someone else down that trail. Someone else? Do I detect a bit of jealousy, Sam? I get over it. A cool thing too is how it connects to the main campaign. Throughout Sam's adventure, Lambert hints at the exploits of the other Splinter Cells. But in the Soul mission, the senior Splinter Cell interacts directly with the junior Splinter Cells for an interrogation, and I thought it would be fun to properly cut it together here. Sit tight, you two. I have another asset on the ground. He's just gotten a hold of the guys who relocated John. Patch us in. All right, Fisher, go ahead. I got someone who wants to talk to you. Roger. Ask him where they took Jong. Where did you take Jong? I... I don't know what you're talking about! He's not answering. Should I kill him? Negative, negative. All right. They say I should kill you, so... Wait! Okay! Jong, we moved him to a cyber cafe just off the fish market by the river. Is that what you needed to know, guys? Uh, affirmative. Thanks a lot, sir. We owe you one. Welcome to the team. What I really love about this mode, however, is that it is a true series of unfortunate events. Where me and my co-op buddy initially tried to be as stealthy as possible, it quickly devolved into frantic killing and, in general, a lot of funny deaths. I could use a hand here! We were cracking up the whole time, and personally, that's all I ever really want out of co-op. A chance to hang out with friends and laugh at gameplay shenanigans. Like when it looks like your co-op buddy just punched a guard in the dick. I'd recommend this mode to anyone. It still plays great and can make for a good, silly afternoon. And if you and your co-op partner want to take it a little more seriously and get through it as pro ghosts, the effort is satisfying and rewarding. Echelon tracked down Doug Shetland in Tokyo six hours ago. From what we've managed to pick out of the air, it looks like he and his men are about to converge on a bathhouse in the middle of the city. The bathhouse, the penultimate mission, is like an obstacle course for the Splinter Cell Advanced, making it one of the toughest missions to get through pure stealth, but also one of the more enjoyable once you know what you're doing. Early in the level, you come to this laundry room, well lit with a guard in the corner overlooking the entrance. Oof. An insecure player might go for the knockout or short out the light, but the real ghosts know there is always a solution. If they hide behind some bins, they can short out a fan blowing on some sheets, which causes them to fall stiff. Sam can use the sheets as cover to this final laundry bin near the entrance. While some will be tempted to press their luck and cross the gap, likely alerting the guard, the real trick is to walk straight back to the wall, the laundry bin perfectly breaking the eyeline of the guard, and slip into a streak of shadow to the exit. Pretty slick, right? Later, the player has to get through some very bright saunas, crawling with guards and fortified with a heat-seeking turret. The trick is to use steam as cover and navigate by thermal, very similar to an obstacle from the first game's penultimate level. But players have to go fast before one of the patrons turns off the steam and blows your cover. 
The final hurdle is getting through an intense firefight that's broken out in the hallways, requiring some very careful timing and cautious, damn near cheesy use of your gadgets. I don't love this section. It's a little wonky for a pure stealth run, but more violent players will get a kick out of it. The big moment of this mission is the showdown with the surprise antagonist of the game, Sam's friend, Doug Shetland. Remember Doug? He's the CEO of a military PMC and an old war buddy of Sam's, who was introduced in Pandora tomorrow when he had to be rescued from the American embassy. Fisher? My god, man, you're getting old. The big twist of chaos theory is that Shetland has been behind everything, orchestrating from the shadows, in hopes to have World War III break out in an attempt to bring about a new world order. On paper, this is a titanic-sized revelation, but in execution, it ends up being an underbaked element of the story. To put it plainly, it's a twist that's hardly earned. It all comes down to how much or how little Doug Shetland is built up as a character. Shetland is mainly fleshed out in Pandora Tomorrow through friendly conversations with Sam, which are pretty brief. It's good to see you again, Shetland. Once we're back home, we'll get that beer. In Chaos, Shetland shows up as a support in the first mission, and isn't really in the game much other than being mentioned here and there. When suspicion falls on him, it comes rather suddenly, and we are treated to a cutscene of him oozing bad guy vibes. Your buddy Nettage is dirty. Cut him loose. Unlike other employers, I don't cut people loose. If you got evidence against one of my guys, I'll help you bring him in. He might as well have a bright neon sign around him saying, I'm the villain, better hate me. Even if players remember Doug from Pandora, there just isn't enough development for this to have any emotional impact. Even Sam doesn't seem to care much about this betrayal. When Shetland is found out, his team is insistent that he put his personal feelings aside. And Sam is basically like, yeah, no, no, I'm good. I'll kill him, no big. Fisher, if Shetland turns out to be crooked, if Shetland is crooked, I'll take him down myself. I mean, if it turned out Lambert was the main villain, that would send some shockwaves. Hmm, I guess that sort of happens in a later game. Oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. But this, eh, this is just a shallow plot device. You've made yourself the instrument of a policy you won't believe in, Sam. What Montreal did get right with Shetland was the encounter with him. Splinter Cell is not a series that easily lends itself to boss fights. I mean, combat to begin with is frowned upon, and even a normal enemy combat encounter can be a huge challenge. How do you make a tougher version of that that feels balanced and good? The answer is, you don't. The first Splinter Cell did away with a final boss and opted for the mission itself to be the final boss, infiltrating the beastly stronghold that was the Georgian Presidential Palace, culminating with you sniping the main bad guy and running away. Pandora Tomorrow did have a final boss fight, but it was basically a sniper battle that's over in seconds if you're smart about it. Not super exciting. For Chaos Theory, Montreal did something pretty cool. They created an intense, concentrated, timed challenge that focused on the base stealth mechanics of the game, essentially the core gameplay loop on steroids. And yeah, I know this isn't the final mission, but I would say this encounter is pretty much the final boss. Shetland has turned into a mad bomber and is setting up time bombs throughout this maze of catwalks and pipes that the player has to navigate through to dismantle them. While doing this, Shetland will appear from the shadows, framed neatly in the environment, and start monologuing like the villain he is, which is a pretty stylish way to do it if you ask me. After disarming the first bomb, enemies start to come into the field, and now on top of figuring out how to get through this maze, you also have to deal with them. <laughs> I remember this scene making me so anxious the first time I played it. The fear was real, and the challenge was more than present. The stakes are high, the player needs to act, and there is a certain feeling of helplessness. And while the trial and error of it all did get under my skin, the scenario became one of the defining moments of the game for me. We've been fighting their dirty little wars our entire lives, and where do we end up? staring at each other down the barrels of our guns. It all culminates in this standoff, which is really just an interactive cutscene, but is pretty intense and fun to watch. I actually wish Chaos Theory found more ways to do something like this. I can't help but wonder what sort of narrative this game would have had if the dev team avoided CG cutscenes and challenged themselves to tell more of the story in engine, in a similar style to this. No more playing around. 
hmm, perhaps they would come up with something like that for a later game. Overall, while the Doug Shetland character is clumsy, the player's encounters with him are anything but. You're right, Doug. I wouldn't shoot an old friend. Fisher, I can't stress this enough. If one Japanese soldier dies, we risk World War III. Locate our officers and find out what the hell is going on there. I'll find them. Kokubo Sosho continues Splinter Cell's streak of having an absolute banger final mission. It's not nearly as intense or complicated as the Georgian Presidential Palace or LAX, but what it is is a concentrated series of stealth obstacles that will challenge players to flex all the tactical abilities they've learned up to this point. Earlier I spoke of branching paths, and I have to bring up one in this mission because it's my favorite in the whole game. At one point, you have to make it through a giant lobby to find a pair of American POWs. The lobby is deceptive tricky. You have to get up some well-lit stairs being overlooked by a guard at his desk, and then deal with another one posted atop the stairs. It's not insanely difficult, but it takes a little patience to get through. There is a better way, though. In the lobby is a towering piece of modern art, damn near acting as a support pillar. You can actually climb up this thing, needing to short out a light to keep cover. Eventually, you'll reach the stone rafters at the top, and it's at this point you might be thinking to yourself, am I supposed to be able to get up here? Am I cheesing the game? Will this even lead anywhere? But sure enough, at the end of it is the opening to a vent, as if the dev team is saying, oh yeah, we planned for this. And that vent takes you right to the POWs. How about that for sneaky? Hey, you, you're American! Maybe, but I'm not here to rescue you. This level also has one other trick hidden up its sleeve. When you get to the lower levels, you learn enemies are sporting only non-lethal weapons, and if Sam is caught, he will be tased and knocked out, waking up handcuffed in a room and being interrogated. Yep, you can straight up get captured in this level. Now we get to see the consequences of getting caught beyond a game over screen. Getting out isn't too tough, though. You have to pick the lock in your handcuffs, and after you make the guards go night-night, recover your gear. I'm okay, Lambert. Non-lethal round. We're planning on interrogating. Obviously, if you're trying to get 100% on this level, this is not wise to do. But it's a shocker of a curveball the first time you play it. And for the grand finale, we have the reveal of the other mastermind in this grand conspiracy, General Otomo, who, like Shetland, is initially depicted as an ally before turning villain. And like Shetland's twist, it's largely ineffective. Otomo tries to take the easy way out, only for Sam to stabilize and exfiltrate with him in a way our Sam is not terribly pleased with. You're going to have to blast your way out. We're over a hundred feet underwater. You're not pressurized, Fisher. It will be a shock but you won't get the bends. Next time, you're going on the mission and I'm making up the crazy plan. And before the credits roll, the third echelon team celebrates as if they're in a cringy sitcom. How about that raise? They're cutting us back. You'll have to settle for a vacation. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, I know, not the most impactful ending in the world, but you can't deny how much fun the tiptoeing journey was up to it. I love this game. I mean, I'd have to to make an indulgent hour plus long video on it. Splinter Cell Chaos Theory is a triple favorite for me. It's my favorite Splinter Cell game of all time, it's one of my favorite stealth games of all time, and it's one of my favorite games of all time, period. Montreal did incredible work on the original game, but here, they simply did it better. They took their formula, kept what worked, fixed what didn't, and ended up with lightning in a bottle. To this day, it's the Splinter Cell in which all new Splinter Cells are judged against. Chaos Theory is not perfect, but its flaws are minimal, and despite pushing that 20-year mark, it still plays beautifully and rivals contemporary stealth experiences. It's a must-play for every stealth aficionado. Lambert, when I think Gorilla, I think Kalashnikov. What do you mean? I've had enough AKs fired at me in my time to tell you that wasn't one. All right. What are your thoughts on Splinter Cell Chaos Theory? Be sure to let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to subscribe, like, and ring the bell for notifications on future uploads. It's a couple clicks for you and a massive help for this channel. And don't be shy, come say hi in the Kirk Collects Discord linked below. And be sure to check out my affiliate links. I'm Kirk and thank you for watching this video. Stay safe out there.